Hello, Matt. Hey, Bill. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? I'm rocking and rolling. Doing well. <laughs> uh, you getting cozier in your in your Beltway offices at the Daily Caller? I am. You know, I think it used to actually going to an office and and all that stuff. Uh, so yeah, getting getting settled in and uh, learning some. You know. Uh, discovering some some good places to eat around the uh, Farragut North slash Dupont Circle area. So, I'm familiar with that hood. It's a good pl- lots of good food around there. Not a bad place to have lunch. So. Uh, I'm a I'm a when, Luna Burger man myself. Well, next time you're in town, if you have some time, I'll take you to uh, some good places. All right. There's too many salad bars. It's my big problem with the Farragut North area. <laughs> you, you can't. You know, you don't need, you know, uh, five salad bars per block. Well, what you need to do is you need to sneak down toward DuPont, which is just a couple blocks away. And it's a lot better, nicer sort of restaurants. Um, you know, not too nice. You can have lunch there, but right. not cafeterias. So that's the key. I was sad that the brick scaler went away. What's that? Are the, the brick, didn't the brick scaler go away? Ah, uh, possibly. Possibly. Was that, a, that was more of a bar, right? But it, it had pub food, and when I lived there in the 90s, it was good pub food. I think that the quality of their food had declined dramatically, which is <laughs> yeah. why they were, they were struggling. But they had and this new, enormous beer list. Not that I'm a beer drinker, but it was just kind of cool. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's kind of an old-school D.C. place that uh, uh, didn't, didn't see it. I, I don't think it's there. At least it was on the, it was on the edge last time I, I checked. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Well, uh, lots going on this week, as you know, and I guess we should start off talking about the possible government shutdown. Of course, Bill, the caveat is that uh, we tape this in advance, so we don't know what is going to happen. So we're taping on Thursday. As we talk, there's no deal. Um, The government would shut down at midnight um, Friday night if there was no deal. Uh, I do think that even if Boehner, Obama, and Reid came up with something before then, uh, it wouldn't be voted on uh, by the time you and I air at bloggingheads.tv. Uh, and the, the likely, there, there would still be a possibility that even if they cut a deal amongst the three of them, that the House Republican Caucus could still reject it. So uh, my money is on shutdown, by the way. If I had to, if I had to predict, yeah. I'd bet shutdown. Uh, and I think it's worth at least discussing what this might mean, uh, or for our purposes, what, uh, how would the politics of shutdown be changed compared to what happened in the 1990s with the advent of uh, right. the media? That's a good point. Okay, so um, for the purpose of argument here, well, not for the for the purpose of agreement, as we're as we're known to do on this show. Uh, Often is uh, I'm gonna I think the government's gonna shut down too. Um, so, but your question your question is an interesting one. Like, how's it gonna be different? Well, so new media is one of the key points. But before I get to that, I mean I think there's some other key points too. I mean Barack Obama isn't Bill Clinton. And I don't think he's as politically adept as Bill Clinton. Um, I, I think might, uh, I, I might challenge you on that premise. Really? Okay. Um, I think that John Boehner will be. Uh, better in this situation, less controversial than uh, than than was uh, Newt Gingrich. I'll partially so, agree on that premise. So there are you know so there are some differences there. Um, but your point about new media, I mean, this is something that like conservatives put a lot of stock in, and we'll see if it matters. But you know, obviously for for decades and decades, you know, conservatives felt very much like the liberals dominated the media. You know, three networks and uh, the New York Times and Washington Post. But even in 1995, I mean, sort of in a post-cable, you know, cable TV era, you didn't have Fox News. Uh, you did have Rush Limbaugh, but you didn't have the blogosphere. Uh, you certainly didn't have YouTube, Twitter, uh, Facebook. None of that existed. Um, and so that is a good that is a good question. Like, aren't this seems I mean, to be a conservative premise when you when you ask. But I've seen conservative Congress people get asked by by reporters, "Why would you do this again? Uh, this totally backfired in the '90s," and they'll say, uh, "Well, you know, now we have Fox News, now we have alternatives to the traditional media. We'll be able to get our message out, and we 
and we somehow couldn't do that in the 1990s. And uh, I think people forget how, uh, or maybe people are choosing not to remember, uh, I mean, Rush was pretty significant. Remember, he was on the cover of Time magazine. He was credited for electing the entire Republican Congress in 1994. There, there were rush rooms and restaurants where people gathered around at lunchtime just like yes. they rushed together over, rush their, over their steaks. Dan's Bake Sale. What's that? And uh, Do you remember Dan's Bake Sale? I don't remember, remember Dan's this? Bake Sale. Okay, so during the 90s, uh, there was some story about how um, some little some little girl, like her, her class, um, had a bake sale to raise money to help pay down the national debt or something, and Bill Clinton thought that was a great thing, and made her like into a little heroine for, for a few minutes. And uh, so Rush Limbaugh had this guy, some, some caller caught up and he couldn't afford the Limbaugh letter, Rush's newsletter. So Rush decided to have a bake sale for this guy. And I think it was in the Midwest somewhere. It was a huge thing. It was called Dan's Bake Sale. And I think like Rush Limbaugh flew in and spoke out. I, I feel like there might have been like musical performances and speeches. And it was this whole like, conservative Woodstock called Dan's Bake Sale that happened in like 1994, 95 or something. It's the, a, more, the more you know. Had, had means to get their message out. Um, you know, they just got beat. And uh, so, I mean, I think it's a very legitimate question. Is this all that different? I mean, yes, there are lots of different platforms available that didn't exist before, but do they amount to something more powerful than what they already had in the 90s? I think that's a very oh, yeah. uh, speculative question. No, I think definitely more powerful. I mean, you know, Bill, you know, conservatives had talk radio, but uh, they didn't have Fox News, which is wildly popular, I don't have to tell you, and incredibly influential. And they didn't, and, and, and they didn't have uh, the ability, uh, they, the, the social networks, you know, Twitter, Facebook, the ability for average people, um, you know, rank and file activists to play a part, to play a role, to push narratives, to kill narratives. Uh, think of the, the Rathergate story as a prime example. Um, you know, I'm not saying that it's analogous to today's story, but I mean, that's an example of how the old media ran with a narrative and it was knocked down by new media outlets and, and, and partially by people who. Um, who just happened to be experts in, like, this weird thing. They could tell that the typewriter wasn't from a certain... I don't get bogged down in the story. But anyway, my point is, like, on one hand, I agree with you. Like, I think it's safe to assume the worst. I always, as a default position, assume Republicans will get blamed. Um, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm worried about Republicans and conservatives who are so convinced that um, things will be different this time because they're failing to learn from history, maybe. On the other hand... A lot has changed, and, and I mentioned some of the things. I mean, again, you know, Obama's not Clinton. Gingr you know, Gingr uh, Boehner isn't Gingrich. But I do think that uh, you know, Fox News and new media. It is fair to say that that those are are game changers. Well, what I mean in that analysis, what seems to be missing to me is, I mean, look, I don't disagree that conservatives have the means to get their own narrative out. They've done it time and time again, um, but. Uh, that doesn't guarantee that the narrative will be accepted by the majority of the country, and I haven't really heard articulated by anybody. Uh, and I've seen I've seen you mention on your blog that the Democratic arguments are recycled from the last time this happened in the '90s. Right. Uh, well, they're predictable. It's going to be, um, you know, Johnny Smith hoped to go to Washington on Thursday with his class field trip. But he'll never get the chance to do that because of John Boehner and the Republic. You know that that sort of it's going to be like well, they'll recycle it because it will it will still be true. <laughs> this <laughs> this Smithsonian will, will be closed again, just like in the 1990s. So you could still say that, and, and they have the advantage of knowing that this didn't work the last time around. So you might as well try it again. I haven't heard Republicans have said, "Okay, I know how we got beat last time, so here's how we're going to recalibrate." Our message and emphasize something different to to deal with that fact. Instead of hearing Newt Gingrich on TV saying, "Oh no, 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 we we actually won last time." What are you talking about? That doesn't strike me as being a particularly constructive way to go about dealing with this. Well, and that's another point. I mean, there are there are, I think most conservatives think uh, it's better to avoid 
the shutdown. Like my take is, I feel like Republicans are and conservatives are are winning in many ways. Um, why take the chance that this could derail some of the very good things that are not only happening, but like the Paul Ryan budget, right? Which actually is talking about cutting 6.2 trillion dollars over the next 10 years from the Obama budget. Much more important to me and for the country, I would argue, than uh, cutting 33 billion versus 63 billion in the rest of the fiscal year. Um, obviously, you know, what's the old saying? Uh, a million here, a million there. Pretty soon, you're talking about real money. Um, but in any event, um, there are, you know, there are certain conservatives and, and certain folks who actually like want um, want a shutdown. And they're sort of cheering it on. So that's another interesting dynamic. Well, it as seems well. like the issue there, and you know, you're you're being more pragmatist, and being and having a better perspective on on the magnitude of the numbers, I think. Um, but other conservatives, I would argue, are falling into the trap that a lot of the left has fallen into in the past two years, which is being uh, unable to. Uh, call a victory a victory and spike the ball and build up momentum for the next fight. Instead, you have um, this notion that if you, if Republicans only won thirty billion dollars of concessions out of Democrats and not sixty billion, then right. that means uh, you should treat that as a loss, and that's going to. Uh, take away your momentum for the Paul Ryan budget fight. If you concede on this now, how can you win the Paul Ryan fight? How can you win the debt limit fight if you're going to capitulate on this one? Well, if you don't call it a capitulation, if you call it a victory, and, and then use it to try to build momentum, maybe it wouldn't be like that. But instead, they seem to be asking for it to be a momentum killer. And I, yeah. I think a lot of the left did that with the health care fight and with the Wall Street reform fight. And with the Recovery Act fight, um, they they chose not to treat these things as victories, and they became self-fulfilling prophecies that they ended up not building much momentum. Well, it, it is interesting. I feel like um, the criteria for being more conservative is not to be more conservative. It's to be a bigger pain in the ass. So, in other words, um, it, it has less to do with your political philosophy than it does with the perception that you're toughest. Or you, so, um, but my take is I'm for what works. I'm for winning. I'm for advancing our ideas, which I believe are best for the country. You're a Charlie and Sheen Republican. I am, and if, in many ways, I am. Um, uh, but, <laughs> you know, minus the goddesses, of course, <laughs> and, and the cocaine. But, um, but so my point, though, is, like, if, you know, I, I think, like, to everything there is a season. Like, there are times when you have to really be tough and, and when a sign of weakness will be taken advantage of. And so if, if being tough gets, gets us ahead, we should be tough. If, you know, declaring victory and focusing on something else gets us ahead, then we should do that. Not just like have this macho thing for the sake of being macho, right? Um, just, just win, baby, is my motto. But like, I mean, it, it's it's a totally um, you, you you can't definitively argue what works and what doesn't until you try something. And obviously, the people who are chanting "cut it or shut it" must believe that uh, if you can't get enough. Uh, uh, cuts right now that shutting uh, having a shutdown will better their argument. Um, I, I would think that's just based on a whole lot of hope and not a lot of evidence. But you, someone who is fully convinced of that, you can't disprove otherwise until it's done. And well, the other thing too is think of the institutional knowledge. I mean, all, you know, a lot of the people who are activists today don't remember. The 1994, 95, the 95 uh, shutdown. How could you not? I mean, it, it, unless you're in your 20s. Well, some of them are, but some of them were just not politically, you know, they weren't paying attention to politics then. And and certainly, if you, I mean, you know, it's not a complicated story to retell. Yeah, but it, it, it's not. It's not an intellectual thing. It's a. Um, it, it's 
you know, look at the people like Boehner who live through it. And they will be much more gun shy or cautious than people like like the freshmen who were newly elected, who maybe they you know, they were alive during the shutdown, but they you know, they they didn't they didn't uh, you know they weren't taken out behind the woodshed the way that like Boehner and Republicans were. Now look, you could argue that um, see you could argue that Boehner and the people who went through it the last time are the ones with the warped. You know, they're living in the past. They're sort of, they've got this baggage. They're traumatized. They're right, they're traumatized. They're haunted by uh, ghosts that, that don't exist. Um, because, you know, Bill Clinton's not president anymore and times have changed. Or you could argue that they're experienced and they are wise and um, they will not be fooled again. You know, pe people weren't all that intimidated by Bill Clinton in 1995. He just well, got whooped. <laughs> I gotta Why tell you, Obama got whooped in the midterm elections. Well, and you're right in the sense that I, mean, I remember he had to give this speech where he said the president's still relevant yeah, <laughs> or something. Widely mocked. <laughs> but I gotta tell you, you don't fully appreciate how Republicans were intimidated and uh, in awe of Bill Clinton. Of in how 95? he got. It. Yes, I mean not as much as at other times, certainly, but it, it, it's when. Um, you know, there's a story uh, that they tell about how to how to train. Uh, I guess it's how to train children, right? And they tell this analogy, and it's like when you get this baby elephant, you know, at the at the zoo or the circus or whatever. When they're a baby, they, they put a stake in the ground and they stake this elephant, you know, and he tries with all his might and he can't pull it away. Well, then, like five years later, it's a full grown elephant. He weighs a ton. And they staked him in the ground, and he could easily pull the stake away if he wanted to, but he won't because he thinks he's staked, and he thinks he can't. And that's how Republicans were. They literally were traumatized by Bill Clinton. And I don't think, I'm guessing you don't fully appreciate it because you you were probably on his side, but um, there was a, 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 a deep frustration and a deep sense that he was, you know, Teflon, that he would always win. And look. Look at how he won the shutdown as a prime example. I mean, you would have the guy on the ropes. It's almost like I remember I'm a Redskins fan. And Joe Montana, you'd almost have the guy sacked, and he would throw a touchdown. I mean, it's so frustrating when you feel like you have somebody, and then at the last minute they pull a rabbit out of the hat. But, I mean, I don't see this notion that some of Clinton's political skills are dramatically better than Barack Obama's. Uh, you have, you know, Obama's ratings now are better than Clinton's were at that time. Uh, after Obama's midterm election losses, he pulled off a uh, trifecta of legislative wins, more so than Clinton did in his uh, you know, lame duck session. And Republicans seem very frustrated and stymied by that. And you certainly aren't seeing the A-list Republican team you know, beating down uh, the doors to enter the presidential race because there seems to be a general perception that Obama's gonna, still going to win. Well, I think um, that has so more to do with Is that frustration still there? I don't think so, Bill. I don't think anybody's afraid of Barack Obama. I think that um, I think that uh, the the reason Republicans have a weak field is no matter who the incumbent president is, they usually win, and um, so they, they they enter into it with you know an advantage. And if you're a top tier candidate, you might think twice. I mean, remember the top tier in '92 set out that election against George H.W. Bush. Um, that's why Bill Clinton won, but or that's arguably why he won. Um, but I think that, uh, I, I, I would argue that Bill Clinton is dramatic, it was a dramatically more uh, polished and, and, and successful politician than Barack Obama. It just seems um, that that sort of underestimation has burned Republicans with Obama every single time. Well, not every time, because, you know, uh, if, if you look at, you know, recent... When, when, when McCain tried to try to minimize him as an empty suit celebrity and raised uh, and lowered his expectations in the debates, that burned him. When they thought Obama couldn't get health care, Charles Crowder said health care is dead after Scott Brown won uh, his, the Massachusetts Senate election. That proved not to be true. Uh, and, and in going into the, into the lame duck session, uh, they thought that he was going to be hemmed in uh, that his mandate was, was stripped from him and he'd have no maneuvering room. 
so it's I'm not, say, I'm not, he's, I'm not he's saying much wilder the Republicans seem to give him credit for, despite the fact that he keeps notching legislative victories. Well, I'm not saying the guy is a joke or that he's not formidable. You don't get to be president of the United States without being formidable. I'm just saying that it, it, it's like, it's like um, if I'm going to go up against a football team or if I'm going to go into a, a football game, um, I don't want to go up against Ben Roethlisberger. I mean, it, it might be that Peyton Manning or Eli Manning or Brady have a great game, but I, I just that's a guy that I specifically fear. And I kind of feel the same way on a given day. I think Bill Clinton has the political tools, the ability, ability to empathize, the ability to get tough. Um, if they were that afraid of Clinton in the 90s, why did they try to impeach the guy? Because they were afraid of him <laughs> to get rid Because they, I mean, they, they and, and by the way, you know, he, just speaking of the frustration, Newt Gingrich was out of office before Bill Clinton was, and Bill Clinton left with very high approval ratings, you know, or at least fairly high approval ratings. So, um, you know, I, it's probably, we've probably done enough relitigating, uh, comparing the two, but I mean, I, just my opinion is that um, I, I don't think Obama can muster the political, uh, you know, because think of it, one of the benefits that the president has or had was the bully pulpit, right? So in, in the mid-90s, Clinton could get media attention any day he wanted, and Republicans were sort of 400, or, or, you know, however many you know, Republican members of Congress in the Senate there are, are all competing against each other. They don't have the bully pulpit. And so that's where I think new media helps, uh, and, and Fox News helps, I think, to, to level but, the playing but field. I do think that that might undercut your other premise involving Boehner, because I agree with you that I would rather have Boehner leading yeah. a, a shutdown fight than Gingrich, uh, certainly in hindsight. Uh, but, but Boehner doesn't command the Republican platform alone uh, because of all these other platforms, because you have Fox News and much more talk radio and many more blogs, and you have lots of backbencher Republicans who are quite eager to stand on those platforms right. and deliver their own messages that are not going to be in sync with Boehner's. Um, might you have the same effect where you have more intemperate remarks being made where, I mean, Dick Armey's point, Dick Armey, who was the majority leader back in the 90s and who said uh, last month, look, Republicans are going to get blamed for this as we did before because everybody knows Republicans hate government and Democrats like government. No one's going to think right. Democrats want this. Everyone will assume that we will. And if you have a lot of Michelle Bachmans out there sounding very gleeful about what's going on, that's mm -hmm. going to undercut Boehner's attempt to say, look, I'm really trying for this not to happen. Well, I think Dick Armey makes a very good point. Um, both, you know, both parties have brands. Um, issues have built-in skews, and I think that uh, I think he's probably dead on. Um, I, I think that's a, a very astute observation. Um, I think your point is also well taken that uh, there is a double-edged sword to to the flattening of the media, and uh, and that um, you know while while new media can empower people to have a voice, that that can ultimately mean that, uh, you know, that, that people who otherwise might be on the fringes are, are given a, a larger platform, um, and that people who are actually empowered to be the leaders, people like the speaker, you know, have to um, compete against the louder and, uh, and more, you know, I'll use the term extreme because uh, somebody advised me when talking about Republicans, it's a good talking point. Um, <laughs> extreme voices out there. So, I mean, it's a good point. It's a double-edged sword. I mean, it's a net win. I, I don't. I, I think that clearly um, that when you consider that Republicans were in many ways shut out of the media for for decades and decades, um, that it's a net win. But but yeah, every every technology has pros and cons, and, and you make a good point. Now, Paul Ryan, the House Budget Chair, uh, this week unveiled a very dramatic 10-year budget proposal. Uh, uh, I don't know if you would agree to say the quintessentially conservative budget proposal. Would you? Is that a fair assessment? I don't know if I would say quintessential because I feel like, um, you know, I read something the other day at, Paul, at, at, a, at the Daily Caller. Um, uh, edit that part out. <laughs> I didn't hear anything, Matt. Uh, I read something at the Daily Caller the other day about how um, the irony that, that Paul Ryan could essentially save some of these entitlements. 
Um, because, you know, there was, was a time. Was that a, was that a, a positive or a negative comment being made about Paul Ryan's budget? It was a neutral comment. It was like irony. You know, there's a theory that FDR saved capitalism by essentially injecting it, with, you know, giving it a, a shot, uh, an inoculation of socialism. And so by uh, co-opting some of the radical left's ideas into the American system, he prevented America from going down that track. I mean, I don't know that it's, I don't necessarily subscribe to that theory, but it's an ironic theory. And so I was making, uh, drawing a comparison that, you know, Paul Ryan, you know, some of these programs are destined to go bankrupt. And by injecting some free market ideas, some user, sort of user driven, uh, you know, free market options into them and preserving the social safety net, as he calls it, it would be ironic if he actually preserved some of like the, the uh, programs at FDR and then later people like LBJ, um, you know, championed. But this, I mean, if the budget passed, it would essentially end Medicare and Medicaid as envisioned by LBJ. It would no longer be uh, an, a literal entitlement if you are old or if you are poor, you are guaranteed a certain um, level of health care. It would, it would subject it to more uh, uh, vagaries of the free market, which is what conservatives have always wanted. Is that, is that fair? I don't know if it's fair. Um, well, first of all, I think Ryan would argue that if we don't do that, that not only will, will Medicare and Medicaid as we know it end, they will end because they're going bankrupt and they're bankrupt in the country. So, I mean, he could argue that... Um, the premise I would not uh, concur with. <laughs> So my understanding is that, and, and of course I'm not an expert, and of course this is going to go to ways and means, and it's not going to, I don't even think Paul Ryan thinks that it's going to come out the way he, uh, he envisioned. Well, they're going to vote on the whole budget next week. Um, also, Bill, another point is, isn't it Al Alice Rivlin, am I right, that she, uh, that she was, what, CBO director for Bill Clinton, I think? And uh, o OMB. Budget, OMB and, and budget director and and served on the Fed, right? And, and and that some of these ideas that she and Ryan worked together on in in the past, for what that's worth. So, well, um, you know, she she did an interview with Ezra Klein at the Washington Post where she disavowed. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, I would yeah. Be interested yeah. She, in that. Uh, she told. I mean, they did work on something. There there, there was a Ryan Rivlin plan. Right. But the version that Ryan put in is not the version that Rivlin subscribed to. Interesting. Well, uh, do you remember what the uh, what the distinction was? Well, basically, what what uh, what Ryan and Rivlin did was essentially a version of uh, the Affordable Care Act, which you might more uh, regularly refer to as Obamacare. Where you create, I like to uh, call it. I like to call it Romney care. Um, you know, regulated marketplaces of, of, of private insurers, uh, and uh, as Ezra Klein said, he actually had some sympathies towards Ryan Rivlin because if you're going to change the fundamental structure of Medicare, at least make it be in sync with the other part of the health care system as it's now been established or will soon be. By the Affordable Care Act, so the whole thing is kind of working on the same same wavelength. And well, the uh, problem with that is that the budget also would get rid of Obamacare, right? I mean, so well, right. I mean, so I mean, what, so what Ryan does is get rid of <laughs> get rid of the Affordable Care Act altogether, uh, and created uh, this system where you give uh, uh, what some are calling a voucher, and Ryan is not, uh, but a, but an amount of money to private insurance companies. Uh, to provide private insurance to individuals, with, and uh, there's no uh, there's no regulation, there's no marketplace regulation, there's no exchanges that set standards uh, for what the insurance companies can uh, need to provide. Uh, at least that's my understanding. If someone in the, in the threads wants to call, excuse me, of butchering that uh, comparison, feel free. That's my understanding. I mean, uh, my understanding is that it that it creates exchanges, and that you're right that the money goes not directly to individuals, but to, um, you know, to what the the insurance plan or whatever. Um, so Rivlin Rivlin goes out and says it's not accurate for Ryan to say now that I endorse his current plan. And in, in defense of Ryan, he was 
he was actually kind of careful not to say it explicitly. He would say, I worked on this with Alice Rivlin. <laughs> he didn't quite then say the second part, which is, Alice Rivlin told me directly I don't, um, I don't endorse this. Uh, so, so that's been a bit of, I mean, I don't think it's that widely known, but in wonky circles, it's been a bit of an, an embarrassment for Ryan. Well, uh, I think it's fascinating, and it also gives us something to link to. Uh, yes. As recline, <laughs> never let it be said that I don't link to Aaron Klein. Uh, to to, to uh, what's his name? Ezra Klein. Ezra. Klein. Ezra. Ezra. Better than Ezra, Ezra Klein. <laughs> he's kind of a big deal. I hear he has an assistant. Uh, he's, he's doing all right for himself. He's okay. I need. Why don't I have an assistant? <laughs> uh, so, uh, so the question, uh, similar question, to the shutdown question. I mean, it's, it's it's still a dramatic proposal on the part of Paul Ryan. Uh, to fundamentally restructure Medicare and Medicaid. Um, Gingrich got in trouble in the 90s for saying he wanted Medicare to wither on the vine. Uh, and, you know, Medicare and Medicaid was sort of the, the, the key club that Clinton used in that shutdown battle to say what the Republicans are demanding is, is extreme and unreasonable, and therefore don't blame me for the shutdown. Uh, Right. Uh, so, are in the conservative blogosphere? Is there an excitement? Oh, now we have you know this whole fiscal 2011 budget is kind of ticky tacky stuff. Now there's this big Paul Ryan budget, a big ideological fight. Um, let's let's you know uh, head to the ramparts with this, or is there a hesitation saying, "Geez, this is uh, we have not prepared the populace for this kind of debate yet." I don't know if, if the timing of this is so great. Uh, do we really want to go down this path just yet? Is there any kind of consternation or is there excitement in, in conservative blog circles that they can play a bigger role with this than perhaps could have been done in the 90s? Well, first of all, it is the nature of blogs to, uh, to be contrarian and to disagree and to not champion stuff. Um, having said that, I think by and large most conservatives are at the very least um, very happy that Ryan has sort of been bold here. Uh, I really admire, and I've been critical of Ryan before, and a lot of people attack me. when I, I wrote something years ago for the Daily Caller pointing out that his record isn't all that conservative, at least on some big, I mean, overall it's conservative, but on some big things, he is not a fiscal conservative. Having said that, um, I, I do buy into the notion that this is a serious proposal. It is an adult conversation. Um, that at least he is proposing something to fix it um, that other people are, are ignoring or not doing. Um, also, his video, he put out this video, which I thought was pretty cool. I blogged about it. I know Ed Morrissey over Hot Air, I think, blogged about it. Um, it. It was really interesting. I mean, it's become like sort of standard for um, politicians, you know, to, to put up videos. And sometimes they're pretty horrible. Like, um, was it Lemieux, Senator Lemieux, who's running, you know, he, he, he was briefly a senator in Florida and he's running now um, against Bill Nelson, apparently, in the primary, put out a hideous video the other day. Um, but I don't know of another time that a politician has used a video this effectively um, that, you know, essentially, um, you know, because budget stuff can be can be so boring and... and Detail, and if you watch this video, which I'm sure we'll link to, you know, it, graphs and charts, but all made fairly user friendly. Um, overall, I mean, I think Ryan is really popular among bloggers. Um, I had lunch with a, a lady yesterday, who um, is not a conservative but thinks he's hot. So I think the fact that he's at least you know young and and, and not you know, not old, um, not you know, I mean, I guess if you're into like wonks, you know, he would be you know. Interesting. So, I mean, look, I, I, I think it's cool that, you know, we've got Ryan and Rubio and people like that are now becoming, you know, the they're, face they're of... They're taking over of, the Peter Orzak slot of, uh, of most eligible Washingtonians. Let me tell you, man, uh, Orzak had uh, some sort of a sex scandal, right? Yeah, don't, yeah. Uh, nerds don't normally get involved in sex scandals, and, but in D.C. You haven't lived in Washington very long, then. <laughs> well, Henry Kissinger said power is an aphrodisiac. Apparently, apparently he's right. <laughs> um, so, uh, getting out of, uh, of Beltway politics for for a bit, um, there is some old media news in old media slash new media news 
in that Glenn Beck uh, is abandoning his perch at Fox News um, with some sense, not, not spelled out, but in a sense that uh, he, he has been building uh, new media platforms for himself, uh, The Blaze in particular, which is his uh, Huffington Post style uh, news site. And he has all, I mean, he's basically found a way to uh, imprint his brand every medium imaginable. Uh, and, you know, you and I were talking about this before we started taping, but it seems like he's made a decision a la Keith Oberman that this cable TV news perch is not essential to one's prominence and influence in this media landscape if you have other uh, new media type perches that you can land on. If you've already built up an audience base for yourself, that they'll follow you wherever you go. You don't need the infrastructure of a uh, established cable TV news station anymore. Uh, now, Oberman's moving moving to another cable station, Current, but Current essentially is uh, it, it's not a, 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 an old style cable TV station. It, it's high up on the on the, the digital TV packages and kind of gets by on having a, a strong online presence too. And Beck presumably is there's why Beck might want to start his own TV station. I don't know if that's true or not, but in any event, he's tried to put together something that's more his and his alone and not reliant on uh, uh, an established cable, cable TV station. And so the question is, does that is, is that strategy uh, functional? Uh, is, or is that just megalomaniac, uh, megalomania getting in the way of a smart business decision, career decision for himself? Well, I mean, look, you're right. I mean, uh, you know, Jazz Shaw over at Hot Air wrote... Um, you know, there, there have been rumors flying around for some time that Beck is considering launching his own network. And if Oprah took OWN for a name, I suppose Glenn Beck could go with uh, GBN. Um, and then he proposes that Morrissey replace Beck at Fox, which frankly is probably a better idea than whatever they'll do. Um, having, having said that, look, I think definitely a couple of things. Number one, um, there is no doubt that having a TV show can help you. I mean, Beck will... Beck, would have never been as big had he not had a time at Fox News. But once you're there, I, I just wonder um, uh, if, so that can serve as a launch pad, right? Um, I, I don't know if he had been there for three more years, if he would have ended any bigger than he is now. There is something to be said for getting out while you're on top. But I think you're right, though. I think that there is, look, I mean, who knows why Beck left? I think there's a, a multiple reasons or possible reasons, you know, you know, he claimed, you know, at one point he's having sight problems. Um, uh, so there was a, a lot of possibilities, but I, I can't help but believe that if he if he thought that uh, that this were the end all and be all, he would go. He would not have gone. He would have, you know, held on uh, to dear life. And look, the guy has a, a successful radio show. He launched this website, The Blaze. Uh, there is talk of him getting, you know, doing his own network. I mean, I, I feel like. People who are very entrepreneurial, um, they're no longer bound to these networks, even hugely successful ones. They can go there, put in a couple years, and then parlay that success into something else. I will say this: another a point that I think other you know that I've made today that that hasn't really been talked about is why would Fox let him go? Because his show is popular; it does do well in the ratings. I compare this to what was called the Rural Purge in the 1970s, when CBS had several shows uh, like Green Acres and the Beverly Hillbillies, which actually were doing very well in the ratings, they're actually winning in the ratings, very popular, And but CBS canceled those shows because they weren't sophisticated, they weren't part of the brand, they were moving to a different image. And I think that's why Fox was happy to, to let Glenn Beck go, because although he had good ratings, he damaged the long-term, larger brand of Fox News. I mean, I mean he was damaging the long-term brand of Fox News because he's crazy. <laughs> and he was becoming increasingly crazy and being anti-Semitic. I mean, when he equated Reform Judaism with ra radical Islam, uh, and I'm not trying to be dismissive of Islam, but obviously um, uh, radical militant terrorist Islam is not, is, not is, a, is a bastardization of actual Islam. Uh, uh, the yeah. only thing I know about Glenn Beck's show is what I see when, you know, The Daily Show or or MSNBC, you know, puts it up. I, mean, I don't watch it that much. 
Um, well, I did watch it. He, it's not quoting him out of context. They're posting actual clips of the show, look, which I, are crazy. I think that Glenn Beck, I mean, I, I have seen him on occasion. I mean, he had, um, I'll give you a great example. Eric Metaxas, who's a great author, who's on my podcast, he wrote this terrific book about Diedrich Bonhoeffer. If you don't know who he is, uh, he was a, you know, a pastor who stood up against Hitler, helped Jews escape from Germany, uh, ended up being part of the conspiracy, tried to kill Hitler, ended up being, you know, killed, murdered, uh, you know, in a, in a, in a, in a concentration camp. Glenn Beck put him on his show. Nobody else does that. So there were interesting, entertaining, educational things on the show. I think if you're a conservative, he helped take down Van Jones. I think he did some good things. But the question is, at some point... I, at the world some is point, a safer place without Van Jones, right? I agree. I agree. But at some point, I feel like, um, even though he was a net plus, Fox probably got out while the getting was good. Um, I mean, his ratings were down. Uh, I, I would argue, you know, I, and I said this, I think, to you on uh, blogging it before. I, I thought that his rally was was a bust. Um, a classic example of a of a uh, unfocused rally. All the wor- the worst lessons of, of liberal protesting in place. <laughs> we had this huge buildup. And then no obvious place for it to go. No next step. No action item. Well, I'm no not a fan of rallies. Or... I'm not a fan of rallies anyway, because that's how almost, they almost always are. But I will say this: I thought his rally was actually kind of inspirational, and um, it could have. I mean, it, I, I thought it could have been very ugly and very bad, and it was actually very positive and very uplifting. Well, I mean, that, it, it, it was, wasn't an ugly day. It just was a uh, uh, ineffectual day. <laughs> Well, uh, that, I think that's ra- that's, but that's how rallies almost almost always are. A lot of them are. A lot of them are. Uh, and uh, and he just he he had been whipping up so much hysteria based on a lot of you know uh, scattershot conspiracy theories, and it seemed to have hit, it hit its saturation point where his ratings started to decline. And Fox was saying, uh, uh, we don't need this type of ranting defining our brand anymore. Uh, we, we have plenty of solid uh, uh, hosts that have strong ratings, but we're being overshadowed by the, the, this guy's lunacy. We don't need it. Uh, and I, I, I commend Fox for having uh, sanity. <laughs> That's the headline. Fox. Bill Scher commends Fox. <laughs> so I mean, re- I mean recognizing that they... Let's all recognize that Fox News has its limit. There, there is a limit at Fox News. It is anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. Congratulations, Fox. Um, I'm glad you approve. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so I think they had an understandable reason to do it. I mean, I, I'm sure Glenn Beck was still making some profit at that time slot, but uh, you know, it's like two million people. They can they can find someone else to get two million people on that time slot. It's not impossible. Well, there's also this this very uh, interesting New York Times magazine piece, like. I don't know, six months, a year ago, about how, uh, you know, he had essentially, everybody else at Fox has offices in their building. He has this Mercury company, which was in a different building, and how he makes a ton of money off, like, merchandising and speaking. Uh, He didn't really make most of his money off of the TV show anyway. I think that uh, he has parlayed the TV show into his own thing, in many ways entrepreneurial, and I think technology and new media can help uh, can help do that in a way that I mean look we talk we often talk about how this empowers the little guy but it, it also empowers the big guy um, even well, someone well, maybe is, I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll see if it works you know, there, there, there was an article I think it was the American Journalism Review which interviewed some of the New York Times reporters that jumped ship and went to the Huffington Post and one of them said you know, you know, everyone said, "Why are you doing it? You're at the New York Times. You're at the, the the greatest brand of journalism in the world. Why would you leave that for the Huffington Post?" And he said, "I got tired of going out into the field and doing lots of reporting, and then having a really great you know anecdote from a real family, and then being told by your editor, you know, this doesn't fit for space. So right. this person's important story has to get dropped. And you go to Ariana Huffington, and she's saying." You know, it's the web. You have all the space in the world. You know, there's no need to cut that that kind of thing. You know, you're, you're darling, it, oh, darling, so, please. My website has plenty of room. <laughs> Put it in there. Do it. Uh, so, 
it's very enticing. I, so I, so it's it's seductive to someone to a, to a, to a, either a, you know hard nosed journalist or a, a, you know an opiner like a, like Glenn Beck to say okay if you do, if you don't want to saddle yourself with the restrictions of being part of a larger operation with editorial standards and forgive me for alluding that Fox has editorial standards. Um, uh, at least they have brand standards. Let's establish that. Uh, that you have to fit into some kind of mold. Uh, if that's not going to be suitable for you, well, I have. It's a new media world. I do whatever I want. Uh, as long as uh, uh, the fans follow me, I can do whatever I want. Uh, so that's a very seductive premise. But I do think it's still a little up in the air whether that can sustain over you know several years, or do you risk flaming out? Um, whereas at least if you're with the New York Times or Fox News, I mean, Fox has been around for, you know, 10 plus, 15 years. Uh, New York Times has been around for, for decades. There's a lot more job security and, and, and assurance of influence at places like that than if you guys strike it on your own. So yeah, I, with entrepreneurialism comes comes risk, and we'll see yep. if these risks, risks prove, um, for, prove sensible. We will. Um, well, so one last uh, uh, topic before we uh, call it a week. Uh, Donald Trump is now uh, is now placing second in polling for the Republican primary, uh, and you got to think it's it's solely on his uh, accusations of the president's citizenship because he hasn't been talking about anything else for the last two weeks. Uh, and I, I've seen I saw one comment at Hot Air by Al Pundit that. Uh, with an acknowledgement by Alapundin, by the way, that this is in part due to his quote-unquote birtherism. So there's some some acknowledgement on the right that uh, I, I take it by using the term that Alapundin thinks birtherism is crazy. Um, well, and, look, uh, I, I, I think I think some of it is that, but I think some of it is that uh, two two other issues. One, it's not that people are birthers and they like Trump because he's a birther. It's that people are sick of political correctness and they admire somebody that is willing to say something gutsy. Um, and I think that's why Charlie Sheen, with his crazy rantings, um, inspired some people. Because I mean, does it concern you as a conservative that to the extent that you want to push back on political correctness, which in theory uh, constricts debate and pushes out opinions that deserve a fair hearing, if now that expands to rejecting correctness, <laughs> actual facts, <laughs> that's going to undermine your ability to, you know, you know cry political correctness every time I'm someone not, challenges your point. Because look, you're, I'm not you saying know, this is a good thing. My conspiracy theory is being silenced because of political correctness. No, you're just wrong. You're just factually wrong. I'm not saying it's a good thing. I'm saying that I think this is one of the rationale. Another rationale for it is that conservatives always decry uh, celebrity and the liberals in Hollywood and pop culture. But they are the, but for, um, like, ironically, and probably because of that reason, they are so desperate for somebody who is a celebrity. Like, nobody will, you'll, you'll never see anybody fawn over celebrity more than conservatives. So, uh, especially if a celebrity all of a sudden says that they're conservative or Republican. So that's part of it. But Eric Erickson at Red State writes, there's a simple reason for, you know, for this, for Trump's popularity. The field is meh. Say what you want about Donald Trump, uh, but he has the veneer of excitement, regardless of how credible you may think he is or is not. So, I mean, I think, you know, part of it, part of it is that the guy's a celebrity, um, but part of it, frankly, is that the field is just so weak that it's opened the door for this. And I also think it's the right moment for him. I think he has seized this perfect storm, this moment in time. I think that he would have been a joke any other time. But for whatever reason, I mean, you he's, thought at CPAC he was a joke. I thought he was. But um, the, look, the polling, <laughs> the polling shows. Well, let's, let's, let's get the polling perspective. He's at second place at seventeen percent. He's not at 50%. Yeah, but the but field is so fractured that you can place second with a low number like 17. That's still, still uh, telling, if you ask me. Still somewhat impressive. But 
But I mean, and I would, well I, I, in fairness to uh, my conservative Republican friends, I, I would think with birtherism as your main electoral strategy, there, there's got to be a ceiling on, on what you can achieve with that, even in a Republican primary. I, I know that uh, there are some poll numbers that suggest that half of Republican primary voters question the president's citizenship. In fact, Trump himself cited those numbers in MSNBC, which uh, made me and uh, my, my, my liberal racist liberal oasis radio show co-host Tracy Olson commented, he, he must be a plant. <laughs> He's actually going on traditional media outlets and announcing to the world that half Republican primary voters don't accept the president's citizenship. That you couldn't ask for a better message from a Democratic perspective. Well, uh, I'll, um, upon that, I'll upon that at Hot Air writes, I assume that a big chunk of Trump's support is coming from the not met contingent, which if true is probably good news for Palenti. I don't I don't get that necessarily, um, but that's what I'll point it wrote. But look, I also, I, again, I, I feel like there are people who are not birthers, but they are fans of someone willing to sort of say something controversial, gutsy, um, in, in the face of. Uh, it, it clearly, you know, it, it's helped them. It's helped them break out. It's helped them get attention. Um, and, and, and he doesn't just say you know bombastic stuff on just the birther issue. Um, I can call it an issue, which is not issue. Uh, if you, but, uh, you know, he he's on multiple interviews now. Openly said, we should be seizing the Iraqi oil, and I only want to go into Libya if we get to take their oil. Which is right, and isn't it telling that 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 isn't making news? That like I, I'll give you another. Like, I interviewed Marco Rubio today. And during our inter interview, he said um, he said that he uh, America should recognize the rebels in Libya. We should create a um, temporary, not the exact word, but a temporary embassy in Benghazi. We should take some of the money from Gaddafi that you know that we've cut off and give it to the rebels. I mean, things which I thought were like really wow. Um, come to find out, this is nothing new. Uh, he had already written this. This is like part of a letter he put out, which I knew he put out a letter, um, but I didn't know that he went that, that he called for for that. Um, and I thought, wow, that's newsworthy. Like, nobody that I talked to knew. It's like I get I don't know whether we've been overshadowed with so much news about you know Paul Ryan and the CR and everything, or or what. But um, I just inundated with information. But um, again, you know, the fact is, people are obsessing over the birther story. And Trump is saying incredibly controversial things um, that are going unnoticed because it's not the birther story. I, uh, but maybe to your earlier point, if if there's this appetite for someone just to say, you know, things that would be deemed politically incorrect, proving he has the uh, the courage to stand up to the media powers that be or the political powers that be, uh, that 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 fits your theory that it's not just that one. Uh, that one topic that he is blogging, it's that he's saying a number of things which maybe, you know, resonate with with, with a certain niche of folks, um, but would generally be considered to be outlandish positions. Yeah. Well, I think we should keep an eye on this because this is the make, the makings of a phenomenon. And uh, will if this, if, if he keeps going, um, at the clip he's been going, this could become very serious. And this is something I've always thought was a sideshow. I mean, do you, do you um, think he's do you think he's serious about running, or is he serious about promoting the Celebrity Apprentice for now? I think he. I, I feel if you would ask me, how do I put this? I'm, I'm more I'm more convinced. I, I'm more of a believer in him today than I was a week ago. And if that trend continues, uh, it would be fascinating. I think I think it was my co-host uh, Tracy Olson that said that the the likely next step is a reality show about him running for president. So once Celebrity Apprentice wraps up in May, I love you it. Just go right into the next reality show in June. I, I think it's it, it could it could be a winner. <laughs> um, should we leave it on that note, sir? Let's do it. Good talking with you. Good, you you too, Matt. Uh, have a have a good rest of the week. Um, uh, is the Daily Caller going to have their offices open if the government shuts down? What's what's the office policy? Are they on the government schedule? Yes, we will be closing.
if the if the government shuts down because we we have this thing where like if the government if it snows right right so uh, I'll put it this way I'm not coming in <laughs> um, I am operating on the government policy I'm a non-essential worker so <laughs> blogging is clearly not essential absolutely well you can't you're not allowed to use your blackberries apparently if you're not essential well I've given up I have an iPhone now so maybe that's okay it's, it's clearly yeah clearly different. All right, Matt. Have a good one. All right, you too. Take care.